so we saw how intraoperative challenges can be managed whether it's subluxated cataracts small pupils dense hard cataracts or managing a pcr sometimes you can have a surgery that's uneventful but it's what you do before the surgery that actually causes a poor visual outcome and that's what dr sandeep nagvekar sir is going to speak to us about oops i made a mistake and your how you're going to deal with post surgical refractive surprise yeah. over Thank to you, you. Uh, before that, can I ask uh, Dr. Suhas one question? That last case which you showed, where you had injected the lens, there was no disturbance of the vitreous mm -hmm. as such. Mm -hmm. I know, but then the PC rupture was very irregular. I saw, but uh. could you have manipulated, because you manipulated it quite well, and when you had manipulated and the lens was wholly in the bag, it seemed quite okay. So well, would you at this it, stage leave it, it there, or mm -hmm. you wanted to uh, bring it up? No, I, I, I was too scared. We were looking at the tear, which was a ragged tear. Huh. In the, in it was only in the periphery in one. No, no, it had no, no, it had gone. almost it had, gone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> would you, would you keep it good. there? No, I would have done reverse. Yeah. 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 Uh, Maipal, you, you saw that? No, you can't do a reverse. If you do a rexis, convert it into a rexis, then only you can do a capture. Otherwise, the, the, the uh, risk for it to expand is always there. So I don't think uh, there is any harm in doing uh, as a preventive because sometimes even at the stage of hydration, hmm. uh, you can blow up or the... At the end, you mean? At uh, the end, end, right. Uh, uh, when you are doing stromal wound hydrating hydration, the wounds, even yeah, at yeah. that time, there are videos which people have shown that uh, that's typical of a polar cat. Polar cat, yeah. yeah. So there's no harm in converting an irregular thing into a round thing because that gives more strength and uh, uh, you are... No, this may not have been convertible, but yeah, uh, yeah, because, because it was too... Uh, see, for, to convert, yeah. if you didn't have a lens there, it's yeah. easy to convert. Yes. Here the lens is all the time coming in the way. Yeah. Sorry. Excuse me. Hello. Slides. So as we've been saying repeatedly, cataract surgery is becoming an increasingly refractive sur sur surgery. Most patients are demanding complete or near total independence from glasses after the operation. And the refractive surprise by definition is the failure to achieve the intended post-operative target. And this can lead to, in a serious way, to gross anisometropia. It can cause a dominant switch. But what more commonly happens is you have a dissatisfied patient in front of you because you have not been able to match his expectations. So the most important part of any problem is prevention. And as you all know, all these things are very, very familiar to you. A very accurate biometry, avoid transcription errors. They happen more commonly than you think. Optimize your A constants. Choose the correct IOL formula and choose the correct lens for the patient's needs and demands. Preventing it intraoperatively, you have to carefully implant the IOL and its haptics both within the bag. We saw a lot of that in the previous thing. Avoid a lens tilt. So often when we are injecting and uh, when we have come to the final stage, the pupil has come down. One haptic has gone in. The second one we have rotated. We feel that it has gone in. But if you are not very sure, you should always use a hook to make sure that the second haptic is also in the bag. And if the IOL has to be placed in the sulcus, you have to make sure that you have made an adequate uh, power compensation. You have to reduce by about half a diopter. The IOL trap technique is a very good technique where you put a three-piece lens in the sulcus and capture the optic within the bag, and there you don't need to make an alteration in your power. And of course, avoid premium lenses when there has been a zonular dehiscence or a posterior capsular rupture. For measurements of actual length, we all know today the gold standard is a swept source OCT. It's far better than the partial coherence interferometry that we had earlier, better than an immersion ultrasound, and of course, better than a standard ultrasound. For measurements of K also, use instruments like the swept source OCT, or use instruments that measure as close to the corneal vertex as possible so that you can get an accurate keratometry. Avoid instruments that measure outside the three millimeter zone. As far as IOL formulas are concerned, if you want to use the regression, for us, the gold standard today is the Barrett suite. The SRKT you can also look at. But in cases where your eyes are too long or too short, do your regression, but also look at the other formulas to get some additional information that you may get. And in case you are looking at a case where there has already been a refractive surprise in the earlier eye to use some of the formulas which have artificial intelligence, such as the Hill-RBF, the LADA super formula, is a good option. 
in cases where there has been previous corneal surgery before, like a LASIK, or where there's an altered cornea because of ectasia, you need to make special compensations in your ILPA. Now, when would you think or view a biometry with suspicion? So in our clinic, if any actual length is less than 21.2 or greater than 26.6 millimeters, we repeat the biometry again. If our mean K is less than 41 or greater than 47, if the corneal astigmatism is greater than two and a half diopters, if the actual length uh, difference between the two eyes is greater than 0.7 millimeters, and if the keratometry mean is uh, readings are differing by 0.9, we tend to repeat the biometry again. Now, sometimes, very often, you'll find that you get a refractive surprise because you have missed a previous case where uh, keratotic refractive surgery has been done before. Very often, the scar has healed so well that you don't see the flap at all, or if there's a PRK done, there's no way to know. Patient very often doesn't volunteer the history, but there are a few signs which you must remember. So that if you have, a, uh, you know, the normal average actual length is between 22 and a half to 24 and a half. And if you find that the eye is longer and you are getting a power which is suggestive of emetropia or hypermetropia, like a 20, 22, then you have to look at the actual length. You could have a long eye, or you, in cases of hyperopic treatment, it may be a short eye. Keratometry, the average mean K for an Indian is around 43.27. If you have flat Ks, maybe the patient has undergone a myopic treatment before. If there are steep Ks, patient has probably undergone a hyperopic LASIK before. Also, ask the patient at the age at which the refractive surgery was done. If the patient has done it into 20s and 30s, he's more likely to have had a myopic treatment. And if he has had it in his 40s and 50s, and very often this gets done, probably the patient had hyperopia. <coughs> One rule of thumb you must remember is that a two-diopter refractive surprise actually corresponds to a three-diopter difference in the IOL power. Now, the event has happened, so you have to identify the cause. Do a formal subjective refraction and don't depend, uh, depend on your autoref, which are not really uh, you know, reliable in cases of multifocal IOLs. Do a proper slit lamp examination. There may be a faint corneal scar or edema. Your IOL may be in the sulcus. The IOL may be decentered or subluxated. And if you have a myopic shift, particularly look for retained OVD between the lens and the posterior capsule. Or if the patient has had a hyperopic shift, do a, a OCT to check for a subtle macular edema. Review the entire refraction history, the biometric process, the IOL selection process, the surgical records. Make sure that there has been no error. Maybe sometimes we have a long day, we've got the wrong lens going in the wrong eye. So all these things must not happen. Not to mention uh, unspoken, but uh, sometimes mislabeled IOL can also be a problem for your refractive surprise. Repeat. Now, once you have done the thing, you repeat the biometry again, and sometimes in the presence of a dense cataract, which was earlier, your actual length may not have been properly uh, uh, you know, uh, derived. So do the biometry again. You may get it right this time. Repeat the case. Look especially in steep case for keratoconus. If there is a previous refractive surgery, look at it again. If none of the above, if none of these have been identified, then the only reason why a refractive surprise has occurred is because the effective lens position has not been determined by any of the formulas that you have done. Each formula has got an ELP that is either inherently there or calculated, depending upon the inputs you have given, and we can elaborate on it later on. But if this has happened in the first eye, it's very likely to happen in the other eye. Now, you've got a problem, so how do you treat it? Well, the first important thing is doing nothing is always an option. You know, you may counsel the patient and you can get along with it. If there's an obvious OVD in the posterior capsular bag, you can aspirate it and tap the IOL properly. And other options, and we'll discuss about that in detail, keratorefractive surgery, IOL exchange, and PG piggyback IOL are the options for treating your refractive surprise. The first important thing is, should you correct this refractive surprise, and when should you correct it? Well, first of all, not immediately, unless there is an obvious wrong IOL. Put, you put in a 19 when you're supposed to get a 26. There's no way he can forgive you. As soon as possible, get the IOL out and put the new lens in. Understand the cause of the problem. Rule out the pathology contributing to the cause. Make sure the patient disappointment is linked to the surprise and not, and it can be overcome by glasses or contact lenses. That you must try out. If he is unhappy, 
put the glass in front of him, a contact lens, he's happy again, you know the refractive surprise is a problem. Make sure that the nature of the eye oil is not the cause of the disappointment. Sometimes, very often, you have a small refractive error and he's got a trifocal lens in the eye. Then he's going to be more unhappy. So you try to find out whether the refractive error is the problem. By three weeks, in most cases, you have managed to identify the cause, but you might well wait for three months before you do the final intervention. In the meanwhile, what do you do? Optimize the ocular surface, prescribe glasses or contact lenses, reevaluate periodically for visual equity, visual quality, and patient satisfaction regarding his quality of life. Very important. Very often, the patients may not opt for a further intervention. Now, depending upon the quantum of refractive surprise, you need to go ahead. If it's a pure mixed astigmatism in a normal eye with a standard known toric oils, then you can do an LRI and get away with it. Or if it has been a toric lens, you need to rotate it by 90 degrees and your problem gets solved. If it's a small spherical or a small spherocylindrical error, if it's very minor, conservative management. If it is a small to medium-sized error, go for keratorefractive refractive surprise. If keratorefractive refractive surgery. If it's a large error, then you have no option but to do a lens-based option of either a piggyback IOL or a lens exchange. Now, for toric IOLs, there are some special considerations. Rotation of the toric IOL will be difficult after three to four weeks. Later rotation may not be possible, and even if it is possible, it tends to slip back into the sleeve, which is caused by the fusion of the anterior and posterior capsules, especially with plate haptic lenses. If rotation is not possible, then you have to go in for keratorefractive surgery or lens piggyback. And toric IOL should always be aligned with the post-operative residual cylinder or as suggested by the Barrett RX formula. Now, what is the conservative management I spoke about? Small cylinders very often are caused by mybobium gland disease or by ocular surface disease. Treating these conditions very often makes them disappear. These conditions may not have been obvious preoperatively, but post-operatively with your antibiotic, steroid, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory regime, they get bad. Uh, Sorry. Can I just take one minute now? Yeah. Fluctuating vision. So it leads to fluctuating vision, and very often, once you treat that, uh, can I go ahead? Yeah. Very often after you treat that, it can uh, get okay. Patients are very often petrified with further surgical procedures. Perform yak capsulotomy. Have a low threshold for doing it, even if there is a mild PCO. In case of small uh, CCC, YAG anterior capsule as well, because if your uh, anterior capsular rexus is very, very small, it's going to fibrose and phimos, and this is going to shift the IOL, and the refractive surprise may increase. Getting the time in right. The first month, post-op regimen, as you do. The second month, treat the surface and the mybobin gland dysfunction. Treat the aqueous deficiency, if any. Re-refract. Check the PC YAG if necessary. Two weeks later, if the patient is happy, leave him alone. As far as keratorefractive surgery is concerned, avoid if the error is more than four diopters. Myopic ablations are more accurate and rewarding. Consider the patient's age. Younger patient, keratorefractive surgery. If there is a prior history of a corneal procedure being done earlier, avoid a keratorefractive surgery. Look for corneal contraindications as in any other uh, LASIK or PRK procedure. Now, what would you do? A LASIK or a PRK? Again, depends on the age of the patient. Look at the epithelium. If it's very irregular, do a PTK first. If it's mildly irregular, do a LASIK. If it's a regular, you can do a PRK or LASIK depending upon the refractive error. IOL exchange or piggyback. If you are doing an early change, then go for an IOL exchange. If it's come very late, it's very difficult to remove that lens, go in for a piggyback such as the salcoflexes. In the piggyback IOLs, the calculation of power and insertion is easy. It's a good option when YAG has been done previously. It's a good option in cases of post-op hyperopia. Check for the anti anticipated post-operative ACD. If it is less than 3.75, you might cause angle closure. Don't look at piggyback options. And unfortunately, rotational stability is a problem with these sulcoflex toric lenses. They tend to rotate, so avoid them as far as possible. Power calculation, if it's a hyperopic error, it's one and a half times the spherical error, spherical equivalent of your refractive error. If it's myopic, it is 1.3 times. IOL exchange is a must if the wrong model of toric IOL is implanted, patient is dissatisfied with the quality of vision, and also if a multifocal lens is, has been implanted, and if the refractive error is greater than three diopters. General advice, Empathize with the patient. Reassure him from time to time. Keep the lines of communication open. Between the first and second month, no, no harm in giving him a call. Let him know that you're with him. 
Rotate the toric IOL if it is greater than 10 degrees in case of T2 and T3, and if it's even greater than 5 degrees in cases of T4, T5 onwards. Contact lens is a trial is a very important thing in all these cases, whether it's a small or large error, because you need to simulate what vision he will get if you were to do some treatment for him. Exactly. And patient's age, as I said, is a deciding factor. What is the future for these kind of cases? Non-surgical adjustments of the IOL power should be possible with advancing technologies. As a prelude to this, it's the 200, 2017 FDA has approved the light adjustable lens where under controlled conditions of exposure to UV light, the many, uh, power of the IOL can be altered. And this is probably what we are looking at in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. That was an excellent.